Welcome everybody. I'm Todd Cole, PGA professional and director of instruction for US Golf TV and VLS Golf. And first of all, on behalf of myself and Nick and Jordy and JT and the whole team, we want to welcome you to this live session this week. We've got a great topic. Today we're going to be talking about what we call situational golf. So what is situational golf? Well, situational golf is all of the shots that come up when we play around a golf that you probably don't really know how to play that you might not even find YouTube videos on or, or information on how to hit them. So as an example, we're going to talk about punch shots. We're going to talk about what do you do if the ball's above your feet or below your feet? What about a fairway bunker or any type of shot that we're faced with when we play this great game of golf that you might not know how to hit? So you know our favorite thing. We love hearing where you're from. So start throwing that in the chat right away. And then also, are there any shots that come about that you faced or that you've faced that you don't know how to play? That's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do is to help you play better golf and enjoy this great game. So we're going to give everybody just a little bit of time. we got people jumping in from all over already. So you know our favorite question. We love hearing where you're from. Um, and what is it that you want us to talk about? So we got people from Texas already jumping in on here. we got my main man, Nick, behind the camera. Nick, give him the thumbs up. There we go. All right. Okay. And we got the Masters. I wore the Masters shirt today for everybody. You can see it right there. I got the Masters shirt on. We're going to be taking the team to the Masters here in a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll be sure to be giving you some information on that. Now, last week in our live session, if you didn't catch that, we talked about the transition. And for those of you who weren't there, the transition, real quickly, as a review, the transition is that moment in time when the club moves from, it's going away from the target, and now it starts going towards the target. So the transition is when the club changes directions. And we've talked about, what if I come over the top? What if I come over the top? And we gave you that great drill. We talked about you know starting down here at the right knee and swinging the club up to right field. We had the right knee, the right field. Then we had a great one in the transition where the club face tends to open up too much. So if you slice the golf ball, what happens? When the club face opens up, we talked about the tee to the sky. And then we talked about contact. The transition, if we have a poor transition, we can struggle with contact and getting that weight going forward. So look, we got people from South Africa. We got Pennsylvania. Like I said, we got Texas. We got people from all over who are jumping in. So what are the types of shots that come about that you're faced with that you don't know how to hit. That's what today's session is all about, situational golf. And also, next week, we're doing something really special. We're doing something special. I'm gonna have Nick put it in the link. We're doing actually a Zoom session, and we're gonna talk about the three things that amateur golfers can learn from the great Jack Nicholas. And what you're gonna find is a lot of the concepts in the vertical line swing, the vertical line swing system that we teach and we wrote the book about, we're going to see in the great Jack Nicholas as well. And next week, we're going to talk about that. It's a little bit different session. You actually have to register for it. It's free. There's no charge for it or anything like that. But we're going to do it a little bit different because we got some slides and some things like that. So, all right, let's get rocking and rolling here. As you know, we want to hear where you're from. Put that in the chat. What are the questions you want us answering? Today, we're talking about situational golf. So let's first of all talk about two shots ball above the feet okay so how do we navigate this shot when the ball's above our feet so basically if i'm hitting the ball towards you and the ball's above my feet like this all right so a couple things you got to be aware of number one is when the ball's above your feet okay all things being equal you're more likely to hit a draw so right-handed golfer balls above my feet if all things are being equal I'm going to be more prone to hitting a nice little draw. Okay, so I'll, first thing you got to understand is what's going to be the ball flight off that. And so you can pick an appropriate target. So if the ball is going to draw a little bit more than normal, right-handed golfer, obviously I'm going to pick out a target that's a little bit more to the right. All right, so that's the first thing you got to be aware of. The second thing that you'll typically, that I have found a lot of, is that generally the ball seems to come out a little bit lower. And when it lands, it rolls a little bit more because it kind of has that draw ball flight to it. So it lands and it rolls out. So those are the first two things I want you to be aware of when the ball is above your feet. Draw biased, come out a little bit lower, 
going to probably roll a little bit more. Now, how do we navigate the shot or how do we hit the shot? Well, the first thing is, and this is one of our golden nuggets, and you should probably write this one down, because this is pretty much true for any shot in golf. When you don't like the lie, when you don't like the lie, I always want you to move the ball slightly back in the stance. You know, in golf and, and like anything, there's always a few golden nuggets that pretty much apply across the board. And this is one of them. From a chip shot to a, a shot from the fairway where the ball's in a divot or the rough, anytime you look at the lie, uphill, downhill, side hill, uh, no grass, too much grass, whatever, if you see a situation where you don't really like the lie, the default is to always move the ball slightly back in the stance relative to where you normally have it. Let me say that again because this is an important one. If you don't, This would probably be a, a, a gem that you could write down. When you don't like the lie, move the ball back in the stance slightly. So ball's above our feet. We know we got a little bit of a draw bias going on. We know it's going to land. It's going to roll out a little bit. So first thing we're going to do is move the ball back in the stance a little bit. Okay, we're going to move that ball slightly back in the stance. We're also going to have a stance that's a little bit wider, and we're going to flare the toe. So if I'm set in here, okay, I'm going to get a little wider stance. I'm going to flare the toes a little bit. Okay, ball's back in the stance just slightly. Okay, the last thing that I'm going to have you do, okay, in terms of the setup, is just, of course, choke down on a little bit. Right, if the ball's above our feet, I'm just going to go ahead and choke down on it a little bit. So this might be my normal grip right here. I'm just going to go ahead and move it down a little bit like that. Okay. Making sense. Hopefully, if it's make, give me some thumbs up. If you can hear me, this is making sense. If you're following along, give me a thumbs up and be sure to let us know where you're from. we got people coming from all over today. This is fantastic. All right. Now, that's how we set up. Now, what about the swing? Okay, now the swing, because the ball's above our feet, is going to naturally be a little bit more around our body. Okay, not going to be that vertical line swing that we love, right? Okay, and just out of curiosity, I sent uh, Nick and the team a message over the weekend. I don't know if anybody, if you guys are watching the golf this weekend, Tournament Players Championship, what, what about some fantastic golf? I mean, these guys played phenomenal golf. Okay, thanks for the thumbs out, up out there, group. I appreciate that. You can hear us and things are going well. But the number one player in the world, Scotty, okay, next time you're watching golf, watch his lead arm. Watch his lead arm and see where his lead arm goes. He's the best ball striker on the planet right now, and his lead arm goes straight back and up like that. Now, I'm not saying, okay, little prop, little push. I'm not saying he read the bad lie, <laughs> okay, but. That lead arm direction straight back and up is a, is a big one. Now, back to the, what we're talking about here. When the ball's above our feet, we're going to naturally be swinging it a little bit more around our body. And that's what's also going to promote some of that draw. So ball above the feet, move it back, wider stance, choke down on a little bit, a little bit of a, of a draw bias. Now, what about if the ball's below our feet? What if it's below our feet? Okay, same thing. We're going to move the ball slightly back in the stance. Once again, we're going to have a wider base. So a nice wide stance, toes out, and we're going to bend the knees just a little bit, okay, so we can get kind of down nice and low. Now, what do you think this ball flight is going to be like? It's going to come out lower again, okay, and it's going to work a little bit the opposite. It's going to be more prone to fading. All things being equal, the ball is going to come out a little bit lower, and it's going to tend to fade, all right? So that's ball above our feet. That's ball below our feet. Now, let me talk about one other shot here. I want to talk about the punch shot. And then hopefully if you got some specific questions or shots that come up that you face that you want us to talk about, put it in the chat right now. Nick's taking notes. Give him, give him the thumbs up. Nick's taking some notes. There we go. Okay. And he's going to be giving those to us in just in a second. All right. Now, punch shots. A punch shot. I'm hitting a shot into the wind. I just want to control the flight of the golf ball. I want to bring that ball flight down. So first of all, a great golf swing to watch for this would be Tommy Fleetwood. Okay. Tommy Fleetwood. He's got this, just this nice little clean motion. All right. So that would be the first thing that I would say is that when you're hitting a punch shot, I like a swing that's a little bit abbreviated, meaning it's maybe three quarters on the back and three quarters on the through. Now, one of the things that's important, here's another golden nugget. Here's another golden nugget for you. 
That is one of the biggest impacts on the height of the golf ball, how high the ball travels is club head speed. Okay, this sounds almost too basic, like, oh, I know that, but do you really know that? And do we think about that when we're playing the game of golf? The more club, all things being equal, the more club head speed we have, the higher the ball goes. Now, the easiest way to know this is if you watch anybody who's super long, like, you know, everybody's got a buddy or, you know, whatever, a cousin who just rips it and hits it, you know, like 320, okay, watch their ball flight. It's always really high versus if you watch like a, a young golfer, 12, 13 years old, okay, although some of these 13-year-olds can really rip it, but you know what I'm saying, like their swing's a little bit slower, and even though they hit the ball just as solid, it doesn't go as high. Now, why is this important when we're hitting shots into the wind? Because the biggest mistake that most of us make when we hit shots into the wind is we try to swing faster or harder. Okay, number one, it's just bad for tempo, it's bad for rhythm or whatever. But even if you do hit it solid and you pick up your club head speed, the ball's going to go higher. Okay, so when we're hitting shots into the wind, we want that abbreviated swing, but I also want you to grab a club with a little less loft. The less loft will bring it down, but the slower swing speed will also bring it down. So let's, let's just talk about a real life example. Then we'll talk about the setup. Let's say I've got a 150 yard shot, 155. Let's say 155. Normal condition, no wind, I'm grabbing my seven iron. Okay, I'm grabbing my seven iron. But let's say I'm into a wind, kind of a stiff wind. Well, I'm immediately going to my six iron. Because it's my six iron, it has less loft, so naturally the ball flight's going to be a little bit lower. Everybody here knows that. But then I can also put a little shorter, i.e. Tommy Fleetwood, and a more smooth swing on it to bring that ball flight down. Okay, so hopefully that's making sense to you. All right, hopefully that's making sense. Now, what about the setup? Okay, we know that. So we know the slower swing speed will bring it down a little bit. Obviously, the less lofted club will bring it down. So what about the setup? Well, number one is I want you to choke down on the club a little bit. So if this would be my normal grip, I'm just going to move my hands down just slightly. Okay, so this would be my normal, right? Nick's there. Thanks, my man. So we got Nick behind the camera there. That's normal. Move it down a little bit. Boom. That would be for my punch shot. Why should I do that? Well, just it gives me a little bit more control over the club, control over the ball, things like that. Now, I'm also going to move that ball slightly back in the stance. Slightly back. And I'm not talking crazy. You know this if you filed any of our stuff. Let me grab my, uh, well, just for demonstration purposes. <laughs> Here's our two iron again. Everybody loves a two iron. There it is. Yep. Okay. So let's say normal with an iron. I might have it off this great logo right here. One of the all-time classic logos, Augusta National, right? That's where, let's say, my ball's position, <clears throat> excuse me, for my irons. If I'm hitting a shot into the wind, maybe it's just a little bit off my buttons or the zipper. Normal, off the master's logo, into the wind, off the buttons, or excuse me, then my zipper. Okay. So I got that bat, I got the ball back slightly. I'm choking down on a little bit. I'm giving it to Tommy Fleetwood whew, right there. Okay. I've got the right club in my hands. I got a little less loft. Okay. And in a nutshell, that's it. Choke down. Ball back, get the right club, give it that little bit of abbreviated finish. Now, here's what I'll tell you. Then, I'm gonna, then we're going to answer some specific shots that you're throwing in there because we got people jumping on from all over. This is fantastic. And we've got some great questions. I can see them putting them in. Hey, you got questions, throw them in the chat. Any shot you faced in golf that you don't know how to hit, we're going to answer that today. Now, here's what I'll say about this other shot, this punch shot. You don't just hit this shot when there's wind. Okay? You don't just hit this shot when there's wind. This is your go-to shot. When you're like, man, I just lost my swing. I, I just don't have it today. It's, it's not happening. That's okay. It happens to the best players in the world. But what is your go-to? Your go-to should be this little three-quarter kind of punch shot. Okay? It's a great shot to have in your bag when you feel like you're losing your swing. Also, it's a great shot when the pin is in the back part of the green. Okay, I got a green, pin's way in the back left corner or back right corner. This is a great shot because it comes in a little bit lower. 
you can land it on the front edge and let it roll to the back versus trying to fly it to the back. That's one of our core strategy ones that we give. All right. Hey, Nick, let's get let's get a question here, a shot that somebody's got. What, what do we got? Yeah, so one, uh, uh, one is just a, a note that kind of goes off of that into the wind. Vernon said he noticed that Europeans play very well when it's windy, right, that you're using Tommy Fleetwood as an example. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second because then Nick's going to look up our next question. So yeah. Vernon brings up a great point right here. And this is something I want you to reflect on because one of the things that we pride ourselves on here at VLS Golf and US Golf TV is we want to keep this amazing game simple. The game is hard, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Far too often, far too often today, people are making this game way too complicated. Okay? It's hard, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So I want you to think, every one of us, to think back on where, did, when you grew up playing golf, when you were maybe, hopefully you were lucky, you got introduced to the game early when you were 12, 13, 14. I want you to think back on that time and what course and where did you play the vast majority of your golf? Okay, well, for me, growing up in the Midwest, okay, our courses here are pretty wide open. There's a lot of wind, but it's pretty wide open. Okay, so my game evolved around that, meaning... I wasn't overly straight off the tee box because I didn't have to be because the fairways are big and wide. And even if you miss the fairway, there's not many trees. <laughs> but I learned a really good wind shot because we played in a lot of wind. Okay, now you look at other people who grew up. Maybe they grew up in the Northwest and there's a ton of trees or they grew up around Pinehurst or whatever. And the course was super tight. Odds are they probably are great drivers. They're super straight off it. Maybe they're not very long, but they're super straight. And so what Vernon is saying there is 100% accurate. When you grow up in situations like in Europe, where there's a lot of wind and a lot of elements, your game evolves to navigate those. Okay? And that's really, when you look back, that's why some of us are probably good in certain areas and not in the others. So, all right, here, let's keep her going. Nick, what do we got for another uh, question? Man, look at these questions coming in here. This is fantastic. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is probably staying on topic here. Steve from Vero Beach uh, is asking about hitting a low under the tree shot. Okay, so the question here is, is Steve, thank you for asking that question. He's wondering, well, what about hitting it underneath like a tree? Okay, same concepts are going to hold true. Same concepts are going to hold true, all right? But one of the things that I see a lot of amateur golfers make this mistake, and hey, I've made it too, is that they're in the trees and they just, they get a yardage. They're like, they're in the trees and they're, they look at the yards, oh, it's 140 yards. And so they just immediately grab their eight iron with very little awareness of trees and the flight of the ball. Okay. So one of the things, and I don't, I've just seen people do this. I don't know how accurate this is, but generally I'll have a lot of people will just like, I got a wedge right here. If I just stand on that wedge, I'll move back here a little bit so they can see that. If I just stand on the wedge, you can see that I'll go this way. There we go. Okay, you can kind of see the angle that that club's pointed at. Now that's not the exact angle that the ball's coming off. Okay, but you get the point, right? If I did this same, well, you couldn't really do it with a forearm because it would just, it'd be so low. You get the point. So the question there is, is, the, is what are we doing when we're in the trees? It's the same process. It's the same process, but you just have to be more aware of what angle that, that shot's coming out of there. So I right, hope that helps. All right, Nick, what else we got? Uh, Vernon was asking, how do you play a fairway approach shot from 130, 150 yards on hard pan or contact area? Okay, so the question here is, this is a great question, Vernon. The question is, is like, how do you play a shot from the fairway when it's really hard pan? Okay, what do you do if it's 130, 140 yards? All right, well, let's go back to one of the golden things we learned. Hopefully you wrote that down. I'm assuming Vernon doesn't like that lie. Hard pan, I mean, I wouldn't like it if I was in the middle of the fairway and I was on hard pan. So what's the rule of thumb? What are you learning here? What are these golden nuggets that you can apply to a lot of things? Move the ball back. So we're going to move the ball back in the stance a little bit. I'd move the ball back in the stance a little bit, Vernon. I would also give it a little bit of forward shaft lean. So when you're set in there, give it a little bit more forward shaft lean. Boom. See that? So if this is normal, I'm going to give it a little bit of forward shaft lean. See that? There's my forward shaft lean. Give it a little bit right there. Okay. And then slightly move the ball back. That'll bring that ball flight down a little bit. 
Okay, and it will help with some contact. And also, by taking that club and moving a little bit forward like that, we decrease a little bit of the bounce. It'll help you take a little bit of a divot off that hard pan, off that hard pan. Okay, making sense? All right, let's get into a couple more questions. I got a couple other things up here that I want to cover, but I want to give everybody out there a chance to, to continue to throw your questions in there. And I appreciate those thumbs up when people are doing that right there. And also we've got Pennsylvania, we've got people from everywhere. If you're just jumping on, put it in the chat. Where are you from? We love hearing where you're from and any questions you might have. All right, Nick, what else we got? Uh, yeah, this is one I don't think we've gotten uh, before. Do you need to have, oh, this comes from David from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, do you have to have a swing speed of 100 miles or more to have a three-wood in your bag? Okay, this is a great question. And as you're thinking, David, thank you for asking this. As you're thinking about questions, these can be questions about uh, on the putting green, chipping, bunkers, different type of courses, wind, rain. It doesn't matter, okay, what it is that you're thinking about. So the question becomes is, do I have to have a certain swing speed to hit a fairway wood? And the short answer to that question is 100% yes. Thank you for asking that question. All right, we've been talking a lot about that here in the company in terms of, because one of the questions that we get from a lot of our students, our experienced students, they can't hit their fairway woods. Can't hit your fairway wood. Now the truth is, is that you can hit a fairway wood, but unless you have enough swing speed, okay, you're not gonna get that golf ball in the air. So a three wood, you know, let's say it's got 13 degrees of loft, 14 degrees of loft, it kind of depends upon the, the manufacturer, but it doesn't have a lot of loft on it. And if you don't have a certain swing speed, even though you hit that golf ball solid, it's gonna stay low. Now remember one of the things that we've learned here, one of the golden nuggets that we shared with you here today is, is that what causes the ball to get up in the air? There's a couple of things, right? Of course, loft on the club. Obviously your nine iron is gonna go higher than your six iron, okay? But the big one is club head speed, okay? If I'm swinging my six iron at 100 miles an hour, okay, and McElroy is swinging at 110 miles an hour for sake of discussion, his six iron is going to go higher than mine because he's got more club head speed. So I would say this. If your club head speed is under 100 miles per hour, I wouldn't be trying to hit a fairway wood off the ground. Maybe a five wood, but I would fall in love with some of these clubs right here. And they don't have to be ours. I mean, we're not, Nick and I aren't here to do these to pitch clubs, but you know, you know, I got the max vert right here. This is a 22 degree. Okay, this is a 22 degree. So I'd start falling in love with your hybrids, 22 degree, 24 degree, 26 degree. And what you'll find is not only are they easier to hit, but you'll find that they'll, they'll go further because they'll be up in the air and they'll launch more. In the launch board. Now, before we jump to the next question, Nick, I want Nick to throw in the chat there again. Next week, we're doing something special. Something special. We're going live, but we're going to be live on Zoom. It's free. No charge for it. It's completely free, but you do have to register for it. And we're going to talk about the three things that we can learn from the great Jack Nicholas. I still think he's the greatest golfer of all time. Some other people would feel somebody else. That's okay. It's up for debate. But there are three specific things that Jack Nicklaus did in his golf swing that allowed him to win golf tournaments from the age of 15 to all the way at 46, he won the Masters, 1986. I remember exactly where I was. If it, does anybody remember that? And where were you at that moment? I can tell you where I was. I was in the basement of my parents' house, a junior in high school, watching that. I don't know. And that, that was one of the moments in my life that's like, I like golf. Man, I like golf. Okay, what else we got, Nick? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, from Manny. He says he needs help decreasing spin and slicing driver. Okay, so, okay, good question for Manny. So what he's talking about there, he says, hey, I need some help in, I'm slicing my driver, okay, and I got too much spin on it. All right, so a couple of things. These are really good. So one of the things is, um, if the ball is spinning too much with the driver, you might want to take a look at getting fit. It could be something as simple as the shaft. The shaft might not be fit for your particular swing style and speed. Could be too whippy. You know, there are some things like that. So that's the first place that I would look. Not that we're trying to sell you golf clubs, but it's part of the equation. The second part I would say is that 
is that if you got a lot of spin on the, your driver, you're probably hitting down on it. And you remember, we've talked about some of these things. We've done some great videos on the driver, how ideally with the driver, we want to be hitting slightly up on it, all right? So if I grab my Maxford driver here, and I'm set in there, if I, I want to maximize this driver, I need to hit slightly up on the golf ball. And when I hit up on the golf ball, that helps launch the ball in the air. But the big thing that it does also is it can help decrease spin. It can help decrease spin. If I hit down on the ball, okay, that generally speaking will increase spin. All things kind of being equal, right? So the first thing I would do is maybe make sure your ball position is good. Maybe get the ball up in the stance a little bit. You might have it too far back. Move it up in the stance just a little bit, okay? So check the shaft, check your ball position, move the ball up in the stance. And number three to fix that is I would work that right, excuse me, right knee to right field. So it's right knee to right field. So you start down here and you swing it up to right field and you rotate it over. Now, last week I shared with you another golden nugget. I love these golden nuggets, okay, because they're things that, that are just, they're knowledge-based. They're not specific to your swing. They apply to all of us. We talked about one of them today. Remember what it was? If you don't like the lie, what do you do? Move the ball back, right? I shared with you last week another golden nugget, which was swing towards the curve. Write that down. Swing towards the curve. What does that mean? That means that if the ball is curving to the right, I'm a right-handed golfer, the ball is curving to the right, I need to swing. If I don't want to curve the ball anymore, I got to swing this club more to the right. Okay? Swing towards the curve. The other one that I've shared a lot with you on, okay, I'm going to talk about some bunker shots here. Friday bunker shot. Everybody ever had that? I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about a fairway bunker shot also. The other golden nugget that we've shared with you here is that you can describe the golf swing in eight words. You can describe the golf swing in eight words. Arms, take it up. Body takes it around. Arms take it up. Body takes it around. So when we simplify the golf swing in its most basic form, the purpose of the arms is to take the club up. The purpose of the body is to take it around. Okay, that's it. That is literally the vertical line swing. The whole book, the bad lie, all the stuff. Arms take it up. Body takes it around. That's a pretty good position, huh? What do you think there, Nick? How's that look? Huh? Dang it. God, I wish I could, I got to be able to get it there in my real swing. I love that spot right there. So those golden nuggets, I share with you those because what I really want to do and what we want to do is increase your knowledge. So let's talk about a fried egg, okay? Let's talk about a fried egg shot. So let me see what we got over here for some clubs. All right, we got to find, oh, we got a wedge right over here. So a fried egg is a shot. When we hit a shot, hopefully everybody knows, let me just describe what that is. We hit a shot in a bunker, greenside bunker. You walk up there and you look at the ball and you're thinking to yourself, uh-oh, I don't like this because the ball, like the ball is literally like buried in the sand. It's like all sand around it and it's just buried, right? And the only thing you can see is just the little top part. That's what we call fried egg. Happens every once in a while. Happens every once in a while. So how do we navigate that shot? Okay, well, let me ask you this question. Do you like the lie? I don't like that lie. <laughs> I don't know about you. So what do you know? I'll move the ball back in the stance a little bit. That makes sense, right? Okay. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole bunker situation. We've done a ton of videos on bunkers. You can check those out if you're interested in how to hit a standard bunker shot. we got some great stuff in there. We cover it in depth in the book. Matter of fact, we're doing another book right now that's all short game. In-depth on putting in-depth on chipping, in-depth on bunkers. Also, we got some great practice plans in there and some information we've never shared with anybody before that's going to be in that. That's coming out mid to late summer. Now, but when you're in that situation where you have that fried egg, the first thing I want you to do is grab your most lofted wedge and you're going to take the club face and you're going to close it a little bit. Okay, we're going to take the club face and we're going to close it. We're going to move the ball back in the stance a little bit. Club face is closed. We're going to get nice and wide. Okay, all the same stuff we talked about. And then here's the key. When you swing this club back, 
you're going to assume the club head very vertical going back. So this would be vertical. Notice the shape of the club head. Watch the angle that the club head works. Okay, versus kind of shallow. See the difference. This would be bad for the fried egg shot. This would be good. It's going more vertical. And then you're going to take the club and pretty much stick it in the ground about an inch behind the golf ball and just give it a little short follow through. So let's pick it up and just boom, stick it into the ground. And what will happen is that ball will pop out. No spin on it, so it's going to land and it's going to roll. Okay, making sense? All right, hey, what else we got? Let's get in a couple more questions here because we've covered some great stuff. We've covered side, we've covered ball above feet, ball below feet, fairway bunkers, wind shots, out of the trees. What else we got, Nick? Uh, yeah, Daisy asks, what is the most used wedge number around Okay, so the question there is, what is what type of wedges should I, be, should I be using around the greens? All right. Well, generally speaking, I I would like if you get if you have the opportunity to practice, if you're practicing your short game, which hopefully you are, okay, I would practice with three clubs. Your most lofted club, which typically should be like a 56 or 58 degree, may, maybe a 60. I'm not a huge fan of 60 degrees of loft for the average recreational player. I like a 58, even a 56. So whatever your most lofted club is, number one. Number two, okay, you want a stock, you want a stock club. That's like a gap wedge. So that's probably like a 54 or a 52 degree. Okay. And then you've got like kind of like a low runner, which is going to be probably like a pitching wedge or a nine iron. So first of all, you want to practice if you're practicing three clubs, you got your little low runner, i.e., nine iron pitching wedge, you've got your stock. Middle of the road, which is like a gap wedge, 52, 54 degree. And then you got your high soft one, okay, which is like a 56, 58. Now, if you don't have the opportunity to practice a lot, which is the case for a lot of us, there's nothing wrong with that. Then what I would suggest is that you do the vast majority of your chipping with your gap wedge, which is a 52 or 54 degree. And you just practice and you hit almost all your chip shots with that one club because I would rather have you comfortable with one club than uncomfortable with three clubs. Make sense? Okay, hopefully that does. All right, what else we got, Nick? Let's get a couple more. We got some great, any, anything to do with golf, situational golf, different types of shots, or anything that you feel right now is really giving you some struggles. Let's talk about it and let's help some people play better. Uh, yeah, Brendan says he has the Max for three hybrid in his bag. Would it be good to have a four hybrid as well? And what would be the advantage of having that? Okay, so the question there is, is that, hey, I've got the max vert 18 degree, but maybe I want the, how about the 22 or something like that? The short answer to that is yes, 100%. See, hybrids are designed, and it's not just ours. I mean, you know, of course, Nick and I and Jordy and the whole team, we love ours, but there's there's other good ones out there, you know. Um, typically, what we find with ours is ours are designed specifically for the experienced golfer, meaning that they have different launch angles and different shafts that match those club head speeds. But a hybrid is designed that to help get the golf ball up in the air for slower swing speeds. So if you don't have a swing speed over 100 miles an hour with your driver, which is the vast majority of us, there's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't mean you can't play great golf. But you should you shouldn't even you should certainly not have a three iron in your bag and not a four iron in your bag and the five iron is iffy borderline six iron i think is okay seven iron and so on because if we don't have the club head speed and we've learned this is what we've learned here today is that if we don't have the club head speed to support that loft that little bit of loft the ball's not going to get in the air and that's why like tour pros they have when they have their driver, they have the least amount of loft. They have less loft than I do because they have more club head speed. So the short answer to your question is yes, I do think it would be a good idea to have a couple hybrids in your bag, 18, 22, 26 degree. I think that would be fantastic. All right, Nick, let's get in one or two more questions. And then let's also make sure we continue to throw that link in because next week, next week, we're doing this Jack Nicholas thing and, and I'm really excited about it because I, I've got three things that I want to share with you that I've noticed in Jack's swing that I think can really help you out. And uh, like I said a couple times, it's free. There's no charge for it, but we got some slides. We're going to do some slides and some pictures. So we're doing a little bit of a different format and Hey, do us a, if you like this stuff, share it with a friend, 
Tell a friend about US Golf TV, VLS Golf, usgolftv.com. That's our website. We got a bunch of free stuff there, free content that we give away. And tell a friend about the Zoom we're doing next week. And let's get some more people there. People just like us who love this game, want to share and want to get better. Nick, what else we got? Uh, yeah, so going kind of back to the, the bunkers, uh, Mini asks, uh, some of our municipal green side bunkers have harder dirt rather than sand you can splash. How do I hit those shots? Okay. Who's that? Manny? Manny, yeah. Okay, Manny, you the man or girl, whatever. Or maybe it's a female. I don't know, but you the person. Let me just say that. You the golfer. I love this because you're asking questions, and I guarantee you – there are other people who are thinking the same thing that you're thinking. So thank you for having the courage to throw those questions out there because there are no bad questions. There are no bad questions. So the question is, is what about those situations where I'm in a greenside bunker and there's no sand? There's no sand. It happens, right? Okay, so here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. We're going to take the club face, and what we're going to do is we're going to keep it more square. Now, you know, in our standard greenside bunker shot, one of the first things we do is rotate the face open, right? We take the club face and we rotate it open, right? But if there's no sand, we're going to keep that club face more square, okay? We're going to keep that club face more square. Now, the ball is going to come out a little bit lower because of that, okay? But I just have to allow and I have to play for that as well, right? So the club face is more square, kind of the same stance. Everything's going to be the same. I'm going to move that ball back just a little bit compared to normal. That's one of the big things we've learned here today is that if you don't like the lie, move the ball back relative to normal for that shot. So we know in a green side bunker shot, we like the ball a little bit forward. But if there's no sand, I'm going to move the ball back a little bit from forward. Now, I'm not moving the ball back in my stance. I'm moving it back relative to where it normally is, okay? Now, the same thing can be said. This is a question that people haven't asked, but what about if I'm hitting a driver into the wind? What if I'm hitting the driver into the wind? That comes up, right? Okay, kind of the same thing. A couple things. One is let's tee the ball a little bit lower than normal, okay? And let's move the ball back in the stance just a little bit. Those couple things can bring some of that ball flight down and help that wind get penetrating through there. So, Nick, let's get into another question. we got time for maybe one more here. Yeah. Uh, Tim Shears is asking about mud on the ball. And uh, is there any truth that the ball curves away from the side with the mud on it? Okay, so this is a good question, Tim. Thank you for asking that. I know you get some rain over there where you're from, and you get some muddy balls every once in a while because it, that, it tends to rain a little bit over in your side of the world there. So, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know if I can – definitively say yes or no to that but here's what i can definitely say is that when there's mud on the ball it's going to react differently than normal lower curve all types i've seen all types of crazy stuff because part of it not only matters is where is it at on the ball of course like left or right but also where is it relative to where the club's going to impact is it on the back side of the ball or the front side of the ball so what i would say is is that when there's mud on the ball, we're a little bit at the whim of what's going to happen. Now, here's what I would do, though. I would go back to that wind shot. I'd move the ball back. I'd choke down. I'd grab a little less lofted club. I'd give it my little Tommy Fleetwood finish. And I would do everything in there under my control to help us control that shape of that ball and what's going on. So, all right. So today we've talked about situational golf. Now, what I'm telling you is next week, we've got the Zoom link coming up. Three things that we can learn from the great Jack Nicholas. You got to register for that. It's free of charge. There's no, no fee for it or anything like that. Nick's put that link in there a couple of times. Make sure and join us for that. And what I can tell you is, hey, if you like our stuff here, subscribe to it, usgolftv.com. We've got a ton of great content there. We're on Instagram. Uh, we're on Twitter. We're all over the place. But ultimately, we're here to help you play better golf. And what I can promise you is this. Is if you follow the vertical line swing, you're going to play better golf. You're going to have less pain, less discomfort. And also, always remember that you don't have to swing like a tour pro to play great golf.